Well, I invite you to take your Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, where we enjoin our study once again, where Paul has written, and this his second inspired uh, epistle to the church at Corinth. He is stunned that they have been so enamored and uh, so uh, impressed by these false teachers. And he's tried to make it about the objective truth that he's taught them. He keeps pointing them back to the gospel and back to what they know about Christ. And yet they're so impressed by these false teachers that Paul has to momentarily sort of enter into the way they're thinking. So they keep, they keep insisting on sort of comparing resumes and comparing abilities. And he doesn't really want to do that. But he embarks on this sort of a, a, this technique in what he calls his, his foolishness. So in words that have biting sarcasm and are very cutting in some ways, you know, Paul begins to uh, encourage them to come back to the truth, to the objective truth that he's taught them. But let's pick up here in chapter 11, verse 1 where he says, I, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me. For I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I'm not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way, we've made this plain to you in all things. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted? Because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. And what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Imagine that you have a, an adult daughter who is engaged and you have met the young man and even his family and they are lovely people. Her fiance, Christopher, is a wonderful young man with godly Christian character and a promising future who shows every evidence of deeply loving your daughter. I mean, you love this guy. He's kind, he's thoughtful, he's fun. He, he, he has worked hard to earn the money to put a down payment on a house. Uh, and he talks with great excitement about marriage and having children with the woman he's grown to love so passionately. But you begin to see troubling signs in her. You notice that when he reaches for her hand, she pulls it back. She never looks him in the eye. 
Now, she tells you she loves him. But she doesn't like talking about planning for the wedding. She never refers to their union that is coming. And worst of all, while Christopher was on a business trip last week, you know, she came in late every night and slipped into her room without speaking to anyone. And you heard her talking on the phone frequently in low tones. And you, you, you couldn't quite make out what she was saying, but you know your daughter. And you know something's going on. And then one night you overheard her conversation and she wasn't talking to Chris, she was talking to somebody named Rebel. And you hear her telling him that she knows he didn't mean to hit her, that crazy things happen when they do meth together. But she's confident she can get the money together to post his bail. Now, at that moment, you're wondering what on earth is possessing your little girl to make such bad decisions. Because you know that she is caught up in the moment, in the here and now, but you, you've lived through stuff. You've seen stuff happen, and you're thinking long-term. You're knowing that the decisions she makes today and who she's with in this very moment and the things that she's doing now can have long-term consequences, that what she's sowing today can reap misery in her life for decades to come, even for her entire life. And while she's living in the moment, so beguiled and captivated by this bad boy who only cares for himself, you're looking far down the road. That's your concern. Can I tell you that that really is one of the great sorrows of ministry? That you often feel like that parent when you see people that you've known and loved and shepherded for years suddenly making bad decisions? When you see little children that grew up in Sunday school, being taught songs about Jesus, and then somehow they go off to college or adulthood, and they abandon the Christ that has been portrayed to them. And by the way, it isn't only about young people, is it? When a professed Christian falls in love with money, and that becomes the pursuit, they used to be faithful, and now they seem consumed only with things and stuff. When a formerly faithful believer begins to spend more time with the world than in the Word, when some family that you've shepherded under the guise of spending more quality time together, suddenly they drop out of church and they're at the lake every weekend or on the golf course and after a few months it's just too hard and almost embarrassing for them to get back in and before you know it, a year or two has passed. They've never even shown up. A few things grieve a pastor like watching people he loves turn to something other than Christ while the dying embers of their love for Jesus smolder out and grow cold. That's exactly what Paul is feeling. I mean, he has invested so much in the Corinthians. I mean, he, he went there where they'd never heard about Jesus. He was the first one to tell them about the Messiah who has come and has given his life for them. He, he taught them the scriptures. He made certain that when he left after 18 months that they were still well cared for and shepherded. And through the months and the years, he's written them letters and he has sent messengers from him to them and he's received letters from them to which he's responded so faithfully. But now that all seems at risk they're making such horrible decisions. They're being seduced and turned aside from what Paul has preached. You know, the thing is for anyone who loves Jesus, the greatest act of love is to connect other people with Christ. It's to see them fall in love with the Savior whom you have fallen in love with. And Paul's deepest desire and greatest joy is to see the Corinthians following his Savior, and yet they aren't doing it. They're beguiled, they're deceived, they're turned aside from the path. And so at this point in the letter, Paul figures the only way he can really get through to them is sort of to enter into their thought processes. If you want to compare resumes, okay, let's do that. I don't like it. It's foolish, but do bear with me 
in a little foolishness. Now, this passage is going to break down in three distinct units. Uh, the verses 1 through 6, and then 7 through 11, and then 12 through 15. E each one, a distinct paragraph, and Paul has a particular goal in each one. The first one here, he, he's explaining what he calls his foolishness. You, you want to compare me to them? Let's, let's just do it. Now, he's going to do it more pointedly and with even more biting sarcasm as the argument goes on in, in the rest of this chapter. But he wants them to be devoted to Christ. This is his goal. It's really not about how they feel about him. That's only relevant to the degree that he is so intertwined with the gospel and that as they're rejecting him, they're also rejecting the gospel he preached. And his concern is that they were deceived rather than devoted. And he says, I, and here he adopts the language of Hosea that we read, I, I have espoused you as a chaste virgin to one husband. Now you recall the book of Hosea we read from there. It's the story of a prophet with a wayward wife. Hosea married a woman named uh, Gomer and they had a child together. They named him Jezreel, which means God sows. Then she has two more children and they aren't Hosea's. They're someone else's, and God tells Hosea to name them a pitiful name, a name that describes the fact that they're illegitimate. The first one is Lo Ruhama, uh, which means unloved or unpitied. And the second one is Lo Ami, not my people. I mean, it's like naming your child literally bastard. What a horrible thing. God tells Hosea to do this, and after Gomer has these three children, she leaves. She goes off pursuing her sin. And after many years, when sin has used her up and her lovers have abandoned her and her passions have betrayed her and she's only a shell of the person she used to be, Hosea sees her one day on the auction block being sold as a slave because she's, she's in debt and she's no good to anyone. And God tells Hosea to buy her, not as a slave, but as his wife. And when he does this, God tells him to change the names of those illegitimate children from lo ruhama, unloved, unpitied, to loved, pitied, a recipient of mercy. To, and from lo ami, not my people, to ami, Mine, my people. And using that story as a background and that language from the book of Hosea, Paul says to the Corinthians, That's, this is what I wanted for you. I, I like, like a father, had betrothed you. I, I, I had promised you to Christ to be a chaste virgin for him, to give him your commitment, your all, your intimacy. This was my desire for you, but I fear that you've been deceived. And now the image changes from Hosea to Genesis, and he invokes the story of Eve. You recall that God had told Adam and Eve that they were not to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and yet Genesis 3 records that Eve saw that it was good for food, and pleasant to the eyes, and desired to make one wise. And she took it and she ate it. And she gave it to Adam and he ate it. You know, when John describes temptation for us, he really describes those three things. He says, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And that corresponds to those three temptations. The three temptations of Jesus, when Satan tempted him, correspond to those three temptations. And what Paul is saying to the Corinthians is, I fear that you've fallen prey to temptation, that you have been deceived rather than being devoted. I espoused you as a chaste virgin, devoted to, to Christ, to one husband, 
But oh, you've, you've been deceived. Your, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. You know, that's never how temptation presents itself, is it? In fact, I think for a Christian, you know, it's not like Satan shows up and says, bow down and worship me. Quit going to your Baptist church and start going to a witch coven. That's not the way it happens. I really don't know of that ever happening. I, that, that's rarely, I, I don't know if that's ever happened, but I, somewhere, somehow, maybe it's happened. But usually the way Satan tempts us is, oh, you can be a Christian and, and just, just that one little word, and. You can follow Christ and be cool. You can follow Jesus and uh, you can accept what science says even when it contradicts the Bible. You, you, you can follow Jesus and be sex positive. You can follow Jesus and be LGBTQ affirming. You can follow Jesus and be a racist. It, it really doesn't matter what we put in the blank. You can look around the world and you can see all kinds of sex, denominations, churches, and individuals who've added the word and to the gospel. Oh, uh, yes, I believe Jesus and this thing. Well, Paul says, then what you're doing is you're receiving a different spirit other than the one that was preached to you. You're receiving that spirit rather than rejecting it. Notice this sort of unholy trinity he mentions, the, another Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel. And instead of rejecting it, you, you put up with it readily enough. You embrace it. Instead of being so offended that anyone would suggest another gospel to you, you you're trying to find a way to adapt it, to embrace it, to put up with it. And you're impressed with skills rather than imprinted with truth. And in verses five and six, he says, indeed, I consider that I'm not in the least inferior to these, you got to put the scare quotes around this, super apostles. Uh, Paul actually coins this word. This doesn't exist anywhere else uh, in the ancient world. This, this is Paul making up a word because they have embraced these guys like, boy, they, these guys are the ones you need to listen to. And here's Paul. I mean, you and I think of him as Paul. I mean, we know he wrote 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. We, we have an admiration, a respect, maybe even a little bit of a reverence for the Apostle Paul. We see him as the great missionary and promulgator of Christianity, but they just saw him as some guy whose body is bent and broken, who really can't speak very well, although he can write a nice letter, but he doesn't compare to these guys. And, and, and Paul says, no, look, I, I don't consider myself in the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I'm not so in knowledge. In every way, we've made this plain to you in all things. Paul is saying that he might be unskilled in speaking, but he knows what he knows. He knows Jesus. He, he knows who Jesus is, and he is preaching the gospel that he received faithfully. And he's communicating that to them. He's showing them the demands of the, of the gospel. He's emphasized objective truth, but they are being swayed by subjective abilities. They like the, the, the slick, polished demeanor of these guys. Paul He's not as skilled as they are. And so we're going with the guys who sound good. You know, uh, it, it's, it's true that throughout Christian history, charismatic personalities have often led people astray. A, a Judge Russell, a, a, a Joseph Smith, a, a, an a Arian, a, all of these different personalities throughout history have led people astray and it's because they're dynamic they they put on the show well paul says no I, I i even though i'm not skilled in speaking i know what i know and what i know is the gospel and i've made that plain to you but they had another another 
complain about him, and that is that he's just too independent. In verses 7 through 11, he has to answer this charge that it might seem odd to us, but they actually complain that he's not taken their money, that he hasn't received an offering, that while he was there, he didn't let them support his ministry. He was fiercely independent from them and refused to take any financial support from them. So here Paul has to give an explanation of his independence. And he makes it clear, verse 7, that he said, did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted? Because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge? Look, I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. So what he's telling them is that his independence from them was in order to make them dependent on Christ. He never wanted them to be confused that if they gave money to him who was preaching the gospel to them, that they were in some way contributing to their own salvation. Now, frankly, preachers the world over ought to be more concerned with this. You know, I've spent a lot of time in Brazil and in Brazil, there are at least two preachers who are billionaires. I mean, American dollar billionaires. And one of them is a guy named Edgir Macedo. And he started a, den a denomination. It claims to be in every country in the world now, but it it's predominantly in Brazil. And I've not been in any tiny little village all over Brazil that you don't have a, a, what they call a temple there. And it's the Universal Church of the Kingdom of God, Edgir Macedo. And he's made so much money. It's a health and wealth gospel. He convinces people that, that their, their great act of faith, you know, is a plant seed faith offering, which he conveniently receives on their behalf. And that when they give to the Lord, God will always give them back tenfold. And you've got these ornate temples all over Brazil. And he got so rich, he, he bought one of the three, the big three networks in Brazil. It would be like a preacher here getting so rich that he bought CBS, for instance. And Edgir Macedo has just made all kinds of money from people and has greatly influenced Brazilian politics for good or bad. The point is, he's done it with the money of a lot of poor people, frankly. And every time I've talked to anybody who's in the Universal Church of the Kingdom of God, like I'll say to them, tell me about your salvation. And here's the way the conversation inevitably always goes. They, well, before I knew Jesus, I had nothing. But now look, I own my own taxi. I've got a house. And this is the way they always describe salvation. Before it, they didn't have anything worth having. Now look at all their stuff. There's no word about repentance or eternal life or salvation. It's all what I didn't have and now what I've got. I, I, I think the Corinthians would be very comfortable with an Edgir Masedu. They'd be very comfortable with someone who tells them that by giving to me, you can contribute to the great work of your own salvation. God will honor your offering and give you reward in eternal life. Now, let me be clear. We don't want to miss the point. Paul is letting his methodology be shaped by his theology. Now, and that's a good thing. That the way we do things is always shaped by what we believe. And what we see in the scripture is that the gospel is free. And we never want to do anything that makes anyone think that they're contributing to their salvation. Can I tell you, maybe the only good thing that I think has come out of the last year and a half of COVID is we no longer pass offering plates. I was trying to figure out a way to stop it. And I was worried, man, if I stop it and then offerings drop, that's going to be on me. And so now we don't pass offering plates anymore. And I got news for you. They're never coming back. And you know why I like it? Because I don't want anyone, if someone visits here on a Sunday, I don't want anyone thinking we're after their money. I don't want anyone thinking that if they put money in the offering plate, that somehow that this contributes to their salvation. You know what I like? I like the people of God determined to give because it honors the Lord. 
And I just want to say a word of thanks to God for you, and I want to say thank you to you because, you know, when March of 2020 happened and we shut down, I was just like, oh, no. You know, we immediately went into cutting our budget, and I just didn't know where it was going. Will people continue to give? You know what? Oh, me of little faith. Little faith in the Lord, little faith in you. And the Lord rebuked me for that. Not only did you continue to give, you gave more. Last year, we paid an extra million dollars down on our debt. It was just uh, uh, amazing the, the way you have been so faithful. And it showed me, you're not faithful because we pass offering plates and you're motivated by guilt. Well, it's there. If I don't put something in, nobody, you know, everybody will think I'm a tightwater or whatever. No, you, you found a way to put it in the basket when you leave or go online or mail it in or just have it automatically sent every month from your checking account. I, I want to say that's what... That is what God's people do. They're not giving because it contributes to their salvation. You're not giving because, oh, if I give this much, God's going to give me that much more. You're giving because you love Jesus. You're giving because your theology shapes the methodology, and that is, this is purely out of love for him. And the Corinthians weren't frustrated because they couldn't express love to Jesus. They're frustrated because... They know Paul doesn't owe them anything. Now, it wouldn't be wrong for Paul to receive an offering. It wouldn't be wrong, right? But what he does is he surrenders the permissible for the essential. It's permissible for him to receive an offering from them, but it's essential that they don't think they contributed to their own salvation. And because he's not convinced they really know that, because he He's, in fact, convinced that they've got the wrong motive for wanting to give, and it's control. They want to control him. And if they're supporting him while he's there, then they feel like they can tell him what to do. And Paul, no, no, I, I have only one boss, and that's the Lord. So he foregoes the permissible, taking up an offering for the essential, which is the free proclamation of the gospel. But reading the Corinthians, knowing they've got the wrong motive for giving, he's willing to be misunderstood in order to show love to them. He says, look, when I was with you in, in need, I didn't burden anyone because the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. See, he took it from the Macedonians because he knew they understood the motive for giving. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way because as the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine, now look, there he, he's using their word, he's using this word, and he's making it clear his so-called boasting is boasting only in Christ. He's glorying in Christ. He's boasting that the salvation is free. And he says, this boasting of mine is not going to be silenced in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because God has provided for me through the Macedonians. I didn't need to take a dime from you. And why? Because I don't love you? No. God knows I do. I'm willing to be misunderstood by you. I'm willing to be falsely accused by you in order to show love toward you that you don't even understand. Man, that's that is the heart of a shepherd. That's the heart of Paul, and ultimately it's the heart of Jesus. That he loves us even when we falsely accuse him, even when we misunderstand him, even when he does not perform the way we think he ought to, even when he will not share his glory with us. He still loves us. Well, on this note, Paul knows this is the big distinction between him and his opponents. He loves them, and those guys don't. So now the gloves come off. Paul has called them super apostles, and he's called them by a few other names, but now he gets extremely direct. What I'm doing, I will continue to do why? In order to undermine the claim of those 
who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. Wow. They are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. For, so it's no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Now, I want to point out a few things here. When Paul clearly identifies them now as false apostles, and he, he doesn't say that they're, these are Christians who are a little misguided. These guys are servants of Satan. You, know, you just don't get much more direct than that. I, but I want you to note that deceptive apostles still look like apostles. This is why it's hard, right? They don't show up with a sign around their neck saying, I'm, I'm an apostle of Satan. They, look, they show up looking very, very much like a faithful Christian. They know how to have a right vocabulary. Uh, and they know how to have Jesus talk. And that's why they're so deceptive. I mean, when Satan deceives Eve, he, he just asks little questions. Did God really say that? Did God really say that? Oh, he knows if you eat that, you'll be like him. See, all at the heart of all sin is the suspicion that God's not good that he's withholding something from you that you'd be better off with. And boy, there's just such a deception in that. These deceptive apostles, they look like apostles and they're deceitful workmen, but Paul wants them to know that deceitful workmen can be effective workers. It's not that they come across as incompetent, inept, unschooled, quite the contrary. They are very diligent. They can quote scripture. They can talk the talk. And Paul says, now you shouldn't be surprised by that, but these guys are disguised. They're disguised as apostles. But no wonder Satan himself disguises himself in light. Disguised angels are, are often cloaked in light. They talk about Jesus. Now here's the thing. They redefine him. Oh, the world is very accepting of Jesus. You know, if at Christmas you wanna talk about a child of peace, born to show love to the world. Nobody gets offended by that Jesus. But if you talk about a Jesus who came to pay the penalty of the sins of the world, that he came to be the object of wrath, God's wrath at sin, the world doesn't like to hear that. And there are so many churches you can visit and step in the, if, if there's a church 75, 100 years old, you would step into the building, you might see Bible stories pictured in the stained glass that the preacher who stands in the pulpit would never go near because he has redefined Jesus. In the 1963 Baptist Faith and Message, for instance, when Southern Baptists approved the 1963 Baptist Faith and Message, it was very similar to the one that they had approved in 1925. But some of the more neo-Orthodox, more liberal elements of the convention insisted on one little preamble being added in there at the beginning of it. And here's what it said. It, it, it said that Jesus is the criterion by which all the scriptures are to be understood. Now, that sounds good, doesn't it? When I say that, you don't immediately think, well, that's bad. Oh, what? So we should understand the scriptures through the person of Jesus. Well, that, that sounds right. But here's what they meant. 
if I read something in the Old Testament that I think is inconsistent with who I think Jesus is, then I'm free to basically discard that. Well, that, all this stuff in the Old Testament about sacrifices and God being angry at sin and all that, that you know, that's, that's not like Jesus in the New Testament. He's so loving and good, and so therefore I'm free to discard that. And you know what? If you can discard parts of the Old Testament because you don't think it's consistent with Jesus, you can do that in the New too. You can say, oh, this stuff that Paul writes about men and women having distinctive roles and the husband being the head of his wife and a male being a pastor, that's, you know, Jesus loved everybody and that's not consistent with Jesus, so I can discard that. And if you can discard parts of the New Testament, guess what? You can then discard parts of Jesus himself that you think are not like Jesus. So when Jesus goes up uh, there in the north to uh, the coast along uh, Syrophoenicia and that Canaanite woman comes to him and, and uh, asks him for something, he says, oh, it's not right to give that which is for the children to the dogs. Oh, Jesus was a bigot there. Jesus had to learn from that woman she had to teach him what Jesus said there. That's not consistent with the Jesus I know. And so I can discard that. Now, you see what you've done all with Jesus talk is simply set yourself up as judge of the text and of Jesus himself. And anything that you think is not consistent with this Jesus that you've created, you discard. And that's exactly what these false teachers do. And by the way, that's why the 2000 Baptist Faith and Message got rid of that statement, because we had seen how badly it had been abused in our seminaries by seminary professors denying the scripture. You know, I, uh, I, I, I watched one day on, telev- on, uh, on the internet, I watched a, a, a liberal preacher preach a text that he did not like, he did not agree with, and he began the sermon by saying how much he hated this passage and that it was bad theology. And he spent 35 minutes of his sermon, basically the whole sermon, discarding everything about the text and saying it it was bad theology, it wasn't consistent with Jesus and the will of God, and the only good thing in it was care for the poor. And when he finished his sermon, here was the amazing thing. He went down front and stood there while they stood up and sang, I surrender all. And I remember thinking, what, what is he inviting anyone to do? I mean, what do you need to surrender once you have totally discarded anything in the Bible that you don't like, and in fact, anything in Jesus you don't like? It sounds to me like you're asking Jesus to surrender all to you, not you to surrender all to him. But I, I was just struck by how they're still stuck in the forms of There are echoes of their faith that is long since discarded. They're still meeting on Sunday mornings. They're still singing out of the hymnal. He's still opening a Bible and talking about it, but there's no gospel, there's no truth. They've totally edited the gospel out. They talk about Jesus, but they redefine him. They they talk about righteousness, but they determine who has it. Why? If you... If you believe in this Jesus, then you, you can't be righteous. If you believe in this doctrine, well, you can't have it. If, if you haven't done this particular thing, you don't have righteousness. I mean, they act as the key holders to, to eternity. In fact, they talk about heaven. But here Paul makes his most damning statement, literally. Their end will correspond to their deeds. They talk about heaven, but they're not going there. No matter how religious they've been, no matter how much Bible talk and Jesus talk they've had, they have totally abandoned the gospel. What a stern warning. I mean, we're sitting here today, not in a building, but in a church that is over 200 years old. And we look around us and there are a lot of other churches 
that are this old and even younger that have departed from the gospel that they once preached. It's, it's truly only a grace of God that the gospel is proclaimed here today. And we must be ever vigilant that that gospel is always preached in the pulpit of the Buck Run Baptist Church. But let's flip this. Along with this stern warning, there's also a beautiful invitation, isn't there? That there's a way for you to have incredible joy and true intimacy with God, and it's to believe the Jesus of the Bible. It's to accept the gospel as it is. And this is what Paul is inviting them to. He, He's stunned that they've departed from it because the gospel is so wonderful and Jesus is so beautiful and this offer of salvation is so free. Why would you want to retreat into anything else when this is what God has for you? This is the invitation that he makes. Why do you want to depart from the one who loves you so much he gave himself for you? And this, this is the cry of my heart as a pastor, that we might find Jesus so compelling, so lovely, his, his gospel so good, his holiness so beautiful that we embrace him, we pursue him, we follow him, we obey him, that there's no part of us that holds back from obedience to him and intimacy with him. And not only that, we should be telling others. We should be leaving this place today telling other people, people that we work with, people in our neighborhoods, people in our families, that the greatest thing that can ever happen to them is to have a love relationship with Jesus Christ because, you know, loving Jesus is most joyful when you help others love him too. And that is what the Buck Run Baptist Church has to always be about. Helping people fall in love with Jesus.